in this video, you're going to hear me say the Ocean County Historical Association. I said it about three times. It's the Ocean County Historical Society. That's where Josh and I were filming. And that's where I'm running, um, that's where I'm working with a colleague. It's, it's really his program and I'm working with him. It's not my program. And um, we're working there during the day with a history summer camp for kids in the area. So when you hear me say Ocean County Historical Association, it's Ocean County Historical Society. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from the New Jersey History Podcast and Kyle Banner is currently holding the camera. Um, but we are here at the Ocean County Historical Society. And if you look in this uh, exhibit here, you have the diorama of the Tom River Blockhouse fight, which happened on March 24th in 1782. So over here we have one regiment of loyalists and on the other side, the other regiment of loyalists while the Patriots are fighting here on a little bit on the outside of the blockhouse as well as inside. Now, when the loyalists attacked the blockhouse in 1782, they not only set fire and destroyed the uh, salt uh, house, which actually didn't, uh, it was more so of a storage facility for the salt which was collected over on Fisher Boulevard. Um, but once they destroyed the blockhouse, they actually destroyed the rest of the village, burning down uh, every single home in the village, pretty much making everybody homeless in a matter of hours. Now, um, the way in which the British got to the uh, blockhouse was from the Atlantic Ocean. They sailed through the Barnegat Bay and landed on what would be Bayshore. And they marched about seven or so miles to the village of Tom's River. Uh, and that's when the fight started. And over here is actually a flintlock pistol, which was believed to have been uh, recovered from uh, Money Island, uh, which is not far from Dillon's Island, which is known as Island Heights today. And this flintlock pistol was actually made in 1690, but of course, you know, the technology didn't change much between the 1690s and the 1780s. So it's really interesting because this, this was likely either utilized in the battle, whether it was, uh, fired and then dropped upon retreat, or uh, maybe somebody just dropped it along the way. Either way, it's a piece of history and it showcases that a small little town on the Jersey Shore is, plays a crucial component in the American Revolution. Josh, where was that made? This was made at the Tower of London, so... Which is not in Tom's River. No, it's not. It's a, it's a bit far away. It's across the Atlantic, but who knows? Maybe it was utilized for a couple of other things aside from warfare. And if you look at the placard, it, it does say that this was authenticated by the Smithsonian Institution as a tower pistol made at the Tower of London in 1690. I've been to the Tower of London. It's an extremely creepy place, and the, this looks exactly like the flintlock pistols that they have on display there. Welcome to the New Jersey History Podcast, and we are celebrating the triumphant return of Josh, Thank you. who is with us. I was saying to Josh beforehand that watching us is like watching Captain America and Orson Welles, if anybody know who, know who Orson Welles is, or should I say Captain America and Orson Welles, <laughs> young Orson Welles. Now, now, you, now you can look it up and, and take time uh, Googling that, because for those of you who are younger, you have no clue who Orson Welles is. Most so now not. you can go ahead and look that up, and you, you'll find it kind of funny. So today we're going to be talking about the Battle of the Toms River Blockhouse, 1782, which I talked about in my previous recording, which is only about five minutes long. If you listen to that at the end, you heard my dog Tank barking as soon as I said that the British surrendered at Yorktown. He did not like that because he is an American Staffordshire Terrier and his breed originated in England. So I guess he didn't like that. And I said, I'm going to embrace the mess, just like in my favorite uh, TV show now, Only Murders in the Building. If you watch it on Hulu, you need to watch that. They make a podcast and they're, they're afraid if, that it's not going to do good, do well. And another podcaster says, if it doesn't, you just embrace the mess and go with it. So that's what I did yesterday. So we are here at the Ocean County Historical Association. So behind us, you can see um, just kind of like an overview of what we put in the intro. We, Josh went through it in the intro. He talked a little bit about the Battle of Tom's River, the diorama. We have that painting back there, the flintlock pistol that was found. Um, the Ocean County Historical Association is located in downtown Tom's River, in Tom's River, New Jersey, Ocean County. And I am only becoming a member now because I was only here maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Basically, this place, just so that you know where, why we're filming in a different place, um, this was a house. And it's still, it's still a house. It's preserved as a museum. And then they built onto it. There's a research facility 
and we are in the basement that has stored various artifacts. Um, I'm not going to go into the history of the house because I will certainly do that on a different episode. Okay, so, so if, you're, if you're from the association and you're watching this, I'm not, it's not that I don't want to talk about it. I will be doing it an entirely different episode on the um, Ocean County Historical Association. Right? If you listen to my podcast, the short one before this, uh, one of the reasons why I am here and Josh came here um, is because I'm doing a summer camp uh, history enrichment program with a colleague who teaches at High School South, Tom's River. And we figured this would be a great place to um, discuss the Battle of Tom's River since we are, what, Josh, maybe a few hundred feet from where, it, yeah. you know, where, where a lot of that occurred. Yep. So background. Um, Overall, I think everybody knows, if you're a history person, you certainly know, the importance of salt, especially for people a long time ago. Salt was not only used to preserve food, but in this case it was used to make gunpowder. So in various parts of New Jersey, along the ocean, and in other states, was not just New Jersey, there were places called salt works. A salt works was a place where they would take water from a salt water Either maybe the bay or wherever they are, an ocean, <clears throat> and they would bake it in these large furnaces, these big ovens in these trays. The water would evaporate. I don't know the exact scientific terms, but in the end, they could scrape off the salt residue, grind it up, and they put it in barrels. And then it would be shipped off to whoever wanted to buy it. Salt in 1782, around that time period, was going for about $15 a barrel, yet General Washington was paying upwards of $35 a barrel on the black market um, from not very honest people who were taking advantage of the Army's need for salt. So that just shows you the importance of the salt works that was in Tom's River. If you know the area of Tom's River, you will know Fisher Boulevard. If you don't, that's okay. The reason why I'm saying that is that's where, at a place called Shelter Cove, where the Tom's River Salt Works was. It was called the Pennsylvania Salt Works. That was the name of it. Because it was commissioned by Pennsylvania's Committee of Public Safety to be established there. It was an investment opportunity for investors. I'm not going into the actual details of that. Um, what is a man called? Savage, who owned that. I just like that name, Savage. It's not, it's not spelled the same way, but Savage. So long story short, um, I'm going to ref- defer to Josh now to give you a little bit of background on why the Battle of the Tom's River Blockhouse or the Battle of Tom's River happened in 1782 by turning it over to him. He's going to talk about the maritime activity that was going on, like what was going on with shipping and interference and stuff like that. Well, in the Barnegat Bay, you had a lot of privateering that went on. And in 1782, the war was over, but privateering still occurred. And understand that privateering is government-sanctioned piracy and totally accepted by those who need supplies, especially the military. Um, But with the war being over, you have these pirates, essentially, taking over British and Loyalist ships and essentially taking what was on the ships and auctioning them off. So in Tom's River, what what was happening was, his name was William Dillon. William Dillon. William was a, Dillon, yeah. yes. He was um, a loyalist. One of his ships um, over in the Barnegat Bay was uh, captured. All of his booty was taken. He said booty. I said, I said booty. All of it was taken, and it was auctioned off in what was Dover Township, just to the villagers. It wasn't going for any other purpose. It wasn't a strategic uh, piracy action. It was merely just doing what they had been doing throughout the war. But the war was over. Six months the war had been over, yet this piracy is still going on. So with William Dillon losing all of his his things, he becomes obviously very angry and frustrated, and he essentially commissions the loyalists in New York to sail down uh, the Atlantic Ocean through the Barnegat Bay and kind of have an act of vengeance against those in Tom's River for stealing his stuff. I'm going to just cut you off, Josh, uh, because we talked about this. The war is over, yes. but really the war is over. 
yeah. because what hadn't been signed yet? The peace treaties had not been signed yet. So not, since, not until 1783. Yes. So the war is over in that the British had surrendered. At this point yesterday, the tank was barking when he heard that. The British surrendered in, at Yorktown in 1781. Battle of Tom's River happens in March of 1782. Mm-hmm. So the war was over, but no peace treaty had been signed. Ben Franklin and others, John Adams, they were over there yeah. negotiating the peace treaty. So the war being over, couldn't that be interpreted differently by different people? Absolutely. And not only that, what eventually happened was that these peace talks had to have been halted. They had to be postponed because of this occurrence in Tom's River. Because what does this mean now? What are the larger implications if we're going to have local animosities between loyalists who are now in a, a now they're living in a foreign land as far as the patriots are concerned? Um, so this had many issues uh, involved. And even though Tom's River was at the time was a tiny little town in what was Monmouth County, because Monmouth County was, there was no Ocean County until the uh, 1850s. So what does this mean now? And General Washington actually had to be involved in the situation because he was going to hang somebody in retaliation for a man that we will be talking about later. He, he, yes. And, and I'm, I'm going to cut Josh off because I'm going to say this, because he didn't know I was going to say this, but before we started rec- recording, um, in this room right now, he was fangirling. I mean, he, he was he was all over this. I mean, he was he was getting. He was getting I was enamored with with the, the artifacts. The here. artifacts in this in this room. I'm not going to show everybody everything because not everybody not everything pertains to the Battle of Tom's River. But you've got artifacts from um, Native American um, arrowheads. You've got uh, the Hindenburg over here. Not over here. I'm not the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg's over there. But. I'm cutting him off because he's very excited about this. But before we get to that part yes. about the, um, I want to go back to something you said about when they arrived. I think it was 1812. There was like a nor'easter. Kind of, I would imagine it was maybe like Hurricane Sandy, not as bad perhaps. But uh, there was an inlet called the Cranberry Inlet. And when that storm came through, it, I guess, filled in. Again, I don't know the, the correct term. It, it, it filled in the inlet. So they were able to sail down from New York. Um, if, you're, if you look, if you're sailing south from New York, you, they made a right into the Cranberry Inlet, into the bay, and they docked at that place we talked about on the map, right at Coates Point. If you're not from the area, that doesn't matter that you don't know the actual names of these places. But if you know the area of Tom's River and you know where the Mathis Bridge is, going into like around Seaside Heights, that's around the area where the Loyalists, the British will call them, would have landed. Josh correctly mentioned a man named William Dillon. Not too far from there was a place called Dillon's Island. Dillon's Island, it's, not an, it's now called Island Heights. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in school, we called it Island Whites, but for a different reason. But um, Island Heights was an island. Now it's not. So again, nature kind of takes over right. and, and, and makes different things happen. So William Dillon, you talked about him, Dillon's Island. Local loyalist merchant, his ships are still being attacked, even though the war is over, technically over. Um, so at this point, we're at the British being here, or the loyalists, whatever you want to call them, is fine. I have to say, we talked about this, I still don't know if they were British regulars, any of them, or if right. they were all loyalists. Well, from because my people are using yeah. British and loyalists like interchangeably. Like, yeah. Were any of them wearing red coats? I think they actually may have been. Yeah. Uh, if you look at a lot of like old pictures or just drawings, rather, of what a loyalist regiment would look like, a lot of them were, they looked like regulars, essentially. And I think a lot of them, maybe like George Washington and other men, would have had their uniforms from the French and Indian War, perhaps. Exactly. So it's not yeah. that they were even uh, issued the, the, the red coats, they just maybe had them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, a, or, and for those who didn't have them, it would be just like a hand me down type of situation. So we'll use, we'll say British loyalists. Yeah. Um, so they are. They arrive in Tom's River. The first thing they do is, is they burn down, attack and burn down the salt works, which is located at a place called Shelter Cove. Mm-hmm. It's not the first time the salt works in Tom's River was attacked. It was attacked in 1778. It's not the first time the Loyalists had planned an attack on Tom's River. They had, they had done that as well. So take us, we'll do it together, take us from the attack on the salt works mm-hmm. to the village. Right, it's about... How far of a march was that? I'd say maybe five miles, yeah. roughly, about five, five miles. miles. Marching down to the salt works. Now, there was a man who was actually at the Cranberry Inlet at the time who saw the British coming in uh, by the name of, it was Garrett Irons? Garrett Irons. Garrett yeah. Irons, uh, who essentially ran over to 
the uh, the salt uh, the salt house uh, to inform, of course, the the, the patriots, uh, and they simply disregarded that. Well, why would the British be coming here, especially at this time during, you know, the war is over? It's been six months. Why would they ever want to come over here and even start a fight? But as we had mentioned earlier, it's because it's this is not really a strategic attack. This is more of a, a, an act of vengeance because of piracy, and, essentially. Right, and and also. Um, I think if I, looking back, we kind of talked about this before, I might have said, um, what loyalists, Josh? We don't have any because we kicked all of them out. Yes. Those people are not allowed to live here. Exactly. Dover Township at the time was a patriot township. It was a patriot village. If you were not uh, supporting the American Revolution, you were not allowed to live there. So the only people that were there were patriots. And this builds animosity amongst the people living there. So when the loyalists uh, land in Bay Shore or by Shelter Cove, yeah. and they're marching five or so miles over to uh, Dover Township or Tom's River, they're going with the intent to destroy everything. And once they arrive, uh, shots fire out. I, I mean, the documentary that we watched, the, the British fired first, of course. It's yeah, never well, of course. <laughs> um, but they were the aggressors. But the question that we always have here is, in this act of vengeance, because of unregulated privateering and piracy, really, is there a justification for the British attack? Is there an understanding for the British attack? Is this just local animosity spilling over into a international uh, conflict, or is this merely neighbor, like, really, they're from New York, so New York and New Jersey just attacking each other again. <laughs> well, well I, I think this is funny because I have to be careful, so I'm glad you're here and I'm not doing this by myself, but I have to be careful because I don't want the Anglophile in me to go, <laughs> like, to become unbridled and, and, like, go after this because I, I, I certainly, I ha in today's climate, of course, I have to say I'm not being unpatriotic. I get the Loyalists' point. I well, it's get the eye it. for the eye mentality, which we will mention, talk about him in more detail. Joshua Huddy, Captain Joshua Huddy, especially had, mm -hmm. and so it's really, as far as my understanding of the conflict between the Tom's River Patriots and the New York Loyalists or the British Loyalists, they're pretty much one and the same. If the rules were reversed, where Dover Township ships were being taken over, I guarantee you that there would be a lot of retaliation, especially oh, sure. in the brand new United States, where who's going to tell them not to attack loyalists? Right. So this whole fight, the reason why we talk about it today is because it halted the peace negotiations. That's, that's the biggest thing about it. Um, but locally, it really was, that, that's, it really kind of just stayed locally for the most part. It was, it was local animosities. This was not like the British trying to like deny their surrender and not acknowledge the, right. the terms of surrender. It this was almost is, as though this was personal. This was, it was very much a personal fight between... Yeah. It, stemming from things that had been building up for a long time. Exactly. And I, I said it before, and I think it's, it's important to say it in front of everybody, that um, the idea that this did not only happen in Tom's River... This did not only happen in Tom's River. This was something that Tom's River, in this case, would have been a microcosm of what could have been happening. It was happening in other yes. colonies or states, maybe by this point. And it's it's very hard for I mean, piracy, for example. I mean, it's it's convenience when you can take something rather than having to get it yourself. It's it's right there, and then it's it's you you don't need to have raw materials. Mm -hmm. You're already done. And they've been doing it for the past several years throughout the war. Six months later, no one's really going to stop. Right. It doesn't really make any sense to stop. You become used to it, and it becomes, it's, it's like um, on a smaller scale, yeah. it's almost like appeasement. Mm -hmm. Like they, 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 you're, you're, used to, you're used to getting away with something, so you just keep doing it. Exactly. And nobody's stopping And you. also, it's, it's for the, the, the loyalists, it's like adding insult to injury. The fact that they already lost the war, and now they're foreigners in their own home. And these acts of, really, I mean, I have to call them piracy. Because at this point, it's not sanctioned. This is, it's just, they're literally stealing 
ships and stealing supplies and selling them to the local villages. It's not going to the Continental Army to support if, the war effort. If they were sanctioned, if they were sanctioned, do you think that would make a difference since the British had surrendered? I guess if, this is more like an opinion question. So if, so you're asking if the war is still over, the, they have surrendered, and this is still sanctioned by Dover Township? Or by the Continental Congress or however you want to look at it. If and that were the case, then I think that we would, the peace negotiations would be halted even further because the British would not, they would say, well, first of all, you're seizing our vessels, not in a time of war, and if it's your local townships that are doing this, you must get them in order before we can sign this treaty. I wonder, and, and I, didn't, I, I didn't look this up because I only just thought of it. It's funny because you, you, it's impossible to know everything about history. If anybody ever tells you they, they know everything about, about history, they are either A, lying, B, they are an encyclopedia, or they are me. Now, nobody can know anything about history. That, 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 that's, that's my preface, what I'm about to say. I don't know the answer to my own question. Um, could the British have assumed that we were going to obey the rules of whatever? I think th I think they thought that from the get go. I mean, and then when you have militias killing British officers, which was something that you normally wouldn't do, it's kind of you respect the higher ranks, uh, at least the armies would. And now you have these guerrilla groups fighting. You would have, I believe, in the beginning they had this assumption that they would that the United States at the time and the Continental Army would abide by these rules of war, especially as they were British subjects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that once you have this guerrilla warfare that goes on throughout the entire war, and essentially without it we would not have won the war, all bets are off. It goes out the window. So I think that this – that's why in this situation when you look at what happened in Tom's River, you can see it really just as an act of vengeance. Do, does the British government really care as much? No, they probably say, well, good for you guys. You got, you got your vengeance that you wanted. And really, what halted the peace talks? Was it the attack on the salt mills and the, the burning down of, of the village, or was it Joshua Huddy? Yeah. Or is, that, it, is, is it a multifaceted issue? Or I, is it, I think that I think that's that's the important question that we, that we want to get to. But I, I'm reminded when you were just talking about um, even in the beginning of the American Revolution that we're British subjects. They assume that we're going to obey the law right. and everything like that, and. It reminded me of the people, I know I'm going to sound like I'm getting political, but I'm not. I say that a lot. I, I do. But it's almost like the people who were like in 2016, oh, not my president. Yeah, yes. Yeah, It's like you don't really have much of a, a choice. That, I, that was yeah. like the British perspective. You're not my, yes, I am. I'm the freaking king. What do you want me? What do you, uh, yeah, you are British subjects. You, uh, I am the law, or this is right. the law. You do have to obey it. I don't care what you like. I just wonder if, like, it, I'm kind of making a connection in my head with that. No, I, I definitely see that as well. It, it's just this, where, are the, where did the standards go? Because what does this mean as a new country when the United States declares independence? What does that mean now? What does it mean for the people there? And that's why when you think about loyalist animosity and local animosities kind of spilling over, mm -hmm. why is that there? And it's a frustrating situation because these loyalists, they, as far as everyone else is concerned, they're in the wrong place. You know, they probably spent their entire lives there. Yeah. Their family members probably moved there from the Mayflower right. for, to escape persecution. And now they themselves are being persecuted. And yes, this was a, 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 a loyalist, elitist, so on. And so people are like, oh, well, who cares? They have money or whatever. And it was bad in New Jersey. It was, It was yeah. usually bad here. And we'll have different future podcast episodes on that. We certainly can if we want to. I was talking yesterday to the other teacher who's doing this program. Um, it's actually his program. I, I, he's, he's allowing me to come in on it, which I'm very thankful for, the summer program. He, we were saying that there's an assumption that every loyalist was like a haughty tea drinking with your pinky yeah. out. They weren't. A lot of them were poor farmers, just like exactly. some of the, the, the patriots were. Yeah. And, and, they, and they were looked down upon, especially during the French and Indian War, by like British regulars, like from the mainland. Mm -hmm. They were not seen as, 
they were seen as British subjects, but not on par with someone who is coming from England. You know, you bring up a great point right there. Kind of getting off topic, but it flows well. I, I think any, anybody who really knows American history, I think you know that the colonists often felt that they were being considered uh, treated as second-class citizens yes. by the mother country, by England. And in many cases, the English or the British, however you want to say that, they did look down on us as colonials. Yes. They did. So for the loyalists to still support them, mm -hmm. knowing how many of them felt about us, that says a lot about the it loyalists. Does. It yeah. really does. It's like they're trying to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in this time for the War of Independence, what is a better time to prove yourself as a good subject? And so we can understand that when this act of vengeance happens, that's the background for it. You know, it's the struggles, it's the frustration, it's the constant uh, just first you have to prove yourself to your home country. Now you've lost and the people who you lost to are still doing the same things which make your life that much harder. And it's really a lack of regard and the lack of understanding for the struggles that the Tories had to go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, if I don't know what I think I'd be a patriot if I lived in this time, but people back then weren't practicing empathy during a time of war. As far as they were concerned, they're traitors. Yep. And the Tories looked at the patriots as traitors, and the patriots looked at the Tories as uh, I won't use that word, but um, <laughs> they, as in, they're just giving in to a a tyranny, which uh, you and I both know really was not a true was not tyranny. A tyranny. Not no, a tyranny. Was not. Um, especially as, as history's played out since then, we know that King George III was not a tyrant. No. Um, but I'm also reminded of John Adams, who I think this was later on in life, so if anybody's listening and, and I am wrong, please correct me. I think John Adams later on in life was recalling back mm -hmm. to the revolutionary time, the revolution times, and said he thought that roughly one-third of Americans were patriots yeah. One third were loyalists and yes. one third were undecided. Yes. So you're not even looking at the patriots are not even the overwhelming majority. No, of the it's population. it's it's literally, it's so split, and that's the thing. And you could see a lot of that even in today's country. Yeah. Like I I would argue that only twenty to thirty percent on right and left are actually oh, adamant. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas yeah. there's this large middle, and that you can divvy up into different sections. So these local animosities. These, these themes of just angers between different ideologies and different goals and aspirations, they've been persistent even before this time. They, the, the issues that we have today, you can see, maybe not the exact issues, but just the willingness to pick a side and mm -hmm. to die for a side, right. is, that's pretty American. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, and what about the people who, not even in Tom's River, but in general, the people who picked a side depending on who was controlling the area exactly. and with whom they could trade and who would buy their grain you do or what whatever. you do what you can what what you do what you have to do you know not everything has to be well for at least those who weren't patriots for example that that fight for independence it's it's treason mm -hmm. why would i want to betray the the country that i was born and raised i mean it's a colony, but I was still born and raised here. Yep. What is going to be the implications of that? You can. There's people who've called the Sons of Liberty like domestic terrorists because mm -hmm. of the things that they've done, the millions of pounds worth of damage that they've caused because of the Boston Tea Party. How can you? And one of the reasons I like having Josh here is because he, my mind goes in seven different ways, and Josh always brings it back to the topic. Which thank you for that. But here I'm, I'm about to go off on another tangent here in a way. So listeners, be beware, be be aware of that. Um. I don't know how it would have even be po been possible for colonists to vote for members of parliament 3,400 miles away. Mm -hmm. And that's, we, that's we want yes. To, we want to, oh, we want representation. What if King George, what if they gave us rep representation? We wouldn't, we, we'd been like, damn it, we wanted a fight, and now they gave us what we wanted. <laughs> Son of a, like, they, 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 they didn't take the, they, they didn't take the, like, they, yeah. because it's not possible. It's not because, and this is obviously when we get into why we fought the revolution in the first place with no taxation without representation. And if you look at British history, 
money always plays a big factor into the country falling apart pretty much yeah, <laughs> with yeah. like Charles II and yeah, so yeah, yeah. on. <laughs> um, but at least in the American sense, this idea that the that a to them a foreign government, which is in a foreign land, taxing our goods that we need, it's not fair. So if we were to have that representation, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it would be more like a Canadian situation in which we would yeah. just... Uh, I mean, will we have elected one person per one colony? One person per colony? 13 people is not going to make that much of a And then how difference. often are they going to go to and Are they going to live there? That's, and then that's how what? do you really know what's going on at Where's home? Where's the correspondence? Six months. No, I'm sorry. No, that's six, <laughs> you're looking at what? Six weeks or something like like back and forth like right, to get there. Get, and that's a lot of taxpayer money, which I don't think that the colonists would have wanted to spend. But that's though all of those things play a factor in what we are talking about today it because it lays the groundwork. This is where <laughs> frustrations arise. This is why people don't get along. Mm -hmm. And when you have this distinction between a loyalist and a patriot, and now you have someone who is an American and someone who is British, that difference between the two is going to justify any action. And that's why you have this act of vengeance, even if it was just on some British loyalist ship and it didn't have any other implication for the war effort, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that they're going to want to fight and get, and get their vengeance. And that's exactly what happened. When they stormed the blockhouse, they burnt down the blockhouse, and they burnt down the village of Tom's River. Yep. They burnt down – people were homeless in a matter of yes. hours. Mm -hmm. So imagine, just in, in context, let's, let's just think that somebody from maybe Long Island or Queens got his buddies – took the Atlantic Railway train down to, I guess, Red Bank or something, yeah. took a ship, went around the Barnic went around the Atlantic Ocean to the Barnica Bay, whatever, and then burnt down your neighborhood. That's essentially what happened. And that would be in a modern context, taking the railways. Right. But that's the point. They came down just for the sole purpose of destroying something. This, was, this, is, this is what happened. It was, it was vengeance. It was all, that's all it was was vengeance. So the people who lived in Tom's River, who weren't part of the militia, they were once again affected because that's how conflicts always end. The people in the middle who are not combatants, the collateral damage mm -hmm. always occurs. So now the, the township of Tom's River, or Dover, is burnt down, and Captain Joshua Huddy, who is a very odd figure, he is... If you watch the documentary that we watched from the Ocean County uh, government from, from 1976, it's yes. on the YouTube channel. It's it's very entertaining. It is. It, uh, I it, it's it's pretty good though. Yeah. But it's da it's dated. But yes. that's just because it's old doesn't mean it's bad. Exactly. Now I will say, and I'm sure you'd agree that there is a bit of a patriotic bias to it. And look at when it was. And it was right. in 1976. Like bicentennial year, exactly. roughly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it's natural. It's normal, yep. Absolutely. So um, Joshua Huddy was a very interesting figure. He was a Quaker who was kicked out of the Quakers for disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct. Whatever I that I means. I love that word. I mean, and as you had told me before the podcast, that to be kicked out of the Quakers, mm -hmm. the most forgiving of people. Yeah, it's that's pretty, yeah. Now, he was um, a a captain in the militia. He was not in the Continental Army, if, I, if I'm... He was yes. a captain in the, in the New Jersey militia. Yes. Now, just to, to say how he ties into um, the Battle of Tom's River, he was the man put in charge of the troops yes. guarding the blockhouse mm -hmm. in Tom's River. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Tom's River was a part of Monmouth County, yeah. mm -hmm. and he was from Colts Neck. Colts Neck, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And so he... Probably as a militiaman. I'm laughing because of <laughs> just our conversation earlier. We, we have to talk about the personal. Yes. Just he, to kind of paint. Go, I think you should start with that. I'll do the personal side and Josh will do the, the military side. Um, you know, it's funny because we, we, we often judge our leaders not by their words or their actions, but by what they've done in their past. Yes. And I am, I get it why people do that. We often like to put our leaders on a pedestal and we want them to be perfect, mm -hmm. whether you're in an army or whether you're a president of, of a country. But if that were the case, we wouldn't have any leaders. Right. Right. So 
when I, what I'm about to say about Joshua Huddy is I'm not saying that people can't do things in their past and move on from them and yes. and become a better person, but his are pretty pretty out there. He yeah. Um, do you want to go into his? <laughs> well, he got married. <laughs> okay, um, people did. He lost his first wife. He got married again, which people often did back then, and um, they owned a tavern. Mm-hmm. And I'm giving you the very, very Cliff's Notes shortened version of this. While in the house with his second family, he had another woman there living with him. And there was a story about him locking his family up in the attic. Yes. And was being with, with the woman when, when the British came after him the first time. You could look into that a little bit a little bit more. Um, and if, if, there, if that's a little cloudy and you have corrections, please feel free to email me. But I don't care if it's 1780 or 2022. That's not right. Yeah, especially, we, yeah. We, we, I mean, there, there's one podcast that I listen to, and I, and I love it, but that the host really does put himself on a pedestal, like, I'm in 2022. I know so much better than people in the past. Oh, wow. You really, really don't, because if you lived at that time, you probably would have done the same thing. Yeah. So I'm, very, I'm, I'm saying this kind of like, I don't even like that I'm saying it, but there are certain things that you just can't do, whether it's the year 2 AD yeah. or 2022. Right. And have, being with another woman... While your family's well, upstairs. Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> locked not, it's, away not, it's not okay. For you know, their protection. Right, it's not okay. So, I mean, not much of that is, like, aside, like why were the... I mean, look, if the British were after him... There Which must they be, were. Where there they must were. be good reason. There must be good reason. And, and that goes talk, into yeah. his, his military past. I mean... If you watch a documentary, they, they kind of say that he's got no sins and done, has done no wrong. But as a militiaman, he probably killed a bunch of officers. That's British, yep. without a doubt. British, it, yep. that's, that kind of goes hand in hand. I mean, it's, it's war. You know, if you want to say it's justified, I mean, are wars justified? That's, that's kind of a conversation for a different day. The yep. point is, is that he killed probably a decent amount of British officers, probably killed a amount of decent soldiers. So they wanted to go back at him, and that's why they were chasing him when he was with the woman, and that's why they were chasing him now, um, especially since he's in charge of the salt, uh, the salt mills. So it's kind of like a two-for-one deal. Right. <laughs> they go after the Patriots who went after William Dillon's ship, yep. right? And that's not the first time they did that. Yes. And then they find out, I, I'm assuming they find out, wow, Joshua Huddy's there too. That's the guy we don't like. Yeah. He's been doing all this na- nasty stuff too. Not exactly. naughty stuff. I'm say naughty stuff. He's doing naughty stuff with the woman in the house. He's doing nasty stuff to the other loyalists yes. throughout the state and through the militia. Um, and it was it was said that he um, he killed spe- specifically a man called Philip White. Right. Of the, you know, a, and a, a that, and militia. so once they burnt down the salt mills and burnt down, or the blockhouse <coughs> rather, and burnt, well, they did the salt mills too, and burnt down the village, they captured Joshua Huddy, brought him to Atlantic Highlands yeah, and Sandy, Sandy Hook, Hook yeah. and they had a pretty quick execution of him. And when they put on a placard that said, uh, what, up for... Like, up for Philip White yes. or something like that? Yes, up yeah. for Philip White, and his last words were that he... You know, he had committed no sins and that he dies like a free man. Something, yeah. And the point is is that if we understand these local animosities and, and this hatred between loyalists and patriots, you know, do we look at the Battle of Tom's River just a little bit differently? It has its impact on history because of the uh, postponing of the, the peace negotiations. That is cut and dry. Mm-hmm. But do we look at it and say, well, it's just – bunch of disgruntled veterans wanting mm-hmm. to get back at one another. And do we look at it as that? I mean, and this kind of goes back to my, my question earlier. Was the attack on Tom's River the issue with delaying the peace negotiations, or was it the execution without trial? Without trial. How he was executed the, without trial. Yes. Was that what delayed peace negotiations? Because this is not a continental officer. This is a militiaman. So let's let's look at that because that that's something we definitely wanted to touch on because um, the what became known as the the um, I called seen it called the Huddy affair mm-hmm. or the Asgill affair A S G I L L it becomes what happened as a result what happened to Captain Huddy as a result of the Battle of Tom's River yes became an international issue mm-hmm. which as you mentioned a couple of times stalled the Paris peace talks. 
that would eventually give birth to the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned before that American representatives like Ben Franklin and John Adams were already in France, and I, I would love to have seen the two of them in France together because if you ever watched the movie, the, the miniseries John Adams with uh, I have, yes. Paul Giamatti, yeah. I think I showed it. I don't know if I showed it when you were in my class or not, but it they do it so well because yeah. here's John Adams like wants to get back down to business, Franklin wants to get in bed with that woman, so it's 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 just so so interesting. So I'm imagining that, but these men are over there trying to negotiate a peace treaty with the British to end the war, formally end the war. And they do, but when Huddy, a captain in the militia, is hanged without a trial, General Washington finds out about it. Mm -hmm. And his goal, or I shouldn't say goal, his, his plan is to, this is nothing new, he didn't come up with it as a result of this incident, his plan is to now hang in retribution an officer that he has in custody mm -hmm. of equal rank. Right. From the British side. And that man's name was Charles Asgill. So that beca this became known as the Asgill Affair, where, all right, also called, called the Huddy Affair. So I guess it depends on how you want to look yeah. at it, because two different people, but th this incident all plays into to each man's um, potential fate. Huddy is executed. Washington finds out he wants to hang someone of equal rank. Asgill's mother has connections in England, who has connections in France. Mm -hmm. So there becomes this whole international thing where, um, I can't think it was the Comte de Vergennes. I don't, I'm probably not saying that right because it's French. Mm -hmm. I think he was one of the ones who was like the intermediary. So the mother is like Lady so-and-so. Yeah. She gets in touch with the French, and the French then get in touch with the Americans back here and the Continental Congress. This is very much in a nutshell overview. The Continental Congress tells Washington, don't hang anybody, no retribution. Right. If there's retribution and you hang the British, the, the war's going to start up again. Yeah. The peace treaty, the peace talks have already st stalled, so let's let's knock it off. We don't. This, these are my words. We don't care about Josh Waddy. We care that if you hang Charles Askill in retribution for the hanging of Captain Huddy without a trial, the war might start up again, and we can't do that. No. Because remember, you can disagree. I don't care if, if, if you do. Not you. I mean anybody. The British Empire did not put their full might behind the American Revolution. Yeah. Or else it would have crushed it. Mm -hmm. In its infancy. Right. So do we want it this to start up again and King George to really let the hammer drop? Because they could have won. Yeah. And what what money now does right. does the we new, have no money. New, the new uh, new country has? Nothing. And we kind of have to do what the French say. Yeah. Because we're now in bed with them. Yep. Because they, they bankrolled our revolution. So we kind of have to listen it to the there, diplomats. It was their blockade. <laughs> right, York. right. And, 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 I, and I often wonder, I think, and listeners, viewers, listeners, if you know this, please email me. Um, do you want to give your email at the end so people want to email you too? Sure. All right, we'll do that at the end. Um, I think this got to King Louis XVI. Probably. I think it got to King Louis. I would imagine as an absolute monarch, I could see it going either way. Either yeah. yes, because he... He had so much authority, yeah. but at, knowing his personality, I think he was more like, yeah. handle it, has it. Like, <laughs> I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm drinking wine right now. Um, Most Because he was raised that way. Yes. You know, it was, yeah. He was raised that way. He, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't the worst King France ever had. He was just very young and inexperienced and have a lot of good, good role mm -hmm. models early on. But um, I want to say that I read somewhere that King Louis weighed in on this situation. So I maybe, think maybe, definitely... maybe listeners or viewers, maybe you can fact check me on that. Or I'm not saying it as a fact, but I kind of think he king, it got all the way up to King Louis the, uh, the 16th. Um, well, especially with all the, the, the peace talks happening in Paris right. and all the money that's probably going to house everybody. And I mean, he didn't really care about spending that much money. So I guess it wouldn't have been a big deal. No. To so delay it another. <laughs> Just starve another thousand peasants. Yeah, not a problem. Let them eat cake. Yeah. That's okay. Now, we, we are aware, of course, of the French Revolution that I. I think I've said in other episodes that in a perfect world, I am a monarchist. I do believe in a monarchy and a landed aristocracy, complete with titles of nobility. But we don't live in a perfect world, so I don't believe in that. But um, King Louis, uh, well, if we're talking about him now, and you'll need to rein me in after this, or I'll keep going. Okay. Uh, King Louis really was just so aloof. Like, they had no clue. It's almost like... 
you look at him, you're like, the poor thing just didn't know. Yeah. Like, it was just so out of his mind, like, didn't even realize. Like, if, pe- they, if they said people are starving, why? Well, why don't they eat? Like, it's almost like, yeah. okay, dummy, well, because you're, they don't have the money. Like, it was just so out of it. Um, but we could, we could actually talk about that in a different episode, too, is France's ties yes. to New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Could maybe even revisit, you know, as a result of the French-American Revolution, the French have their revolution. We don't help them. Right. Napoleon eventually comes to power, and then his brother comes to New Jersey. So mm-hmm. there is that little tie-in. So I wasn't totally off. No, I, I, totally well, I think there. that the discussion about those in charge— those elitists who are negotiating these these terms of surrender and those who are harboring these terms of surrender essentially you know what does that mean on, on for a local township to say hey they burnt down our town can you do something about it for washington to say sorry i can't do anything about it it's not really it's out of my hands mm-hmm. you know you guys it's more of a local issue we have to sign this treaty and get on with this because we just fought a war for what eight years yeah so it's Sorry. How, how political is that? Sim- <laughs> that, that well, that's sounded? the thing. Things that make sense politically don't have to make sense morally. Yeah. That's just the reality of things. It doesn't have to, you know, the, the local township could be burnt down, but that's not going to be enough to, to stall a peace treaty. I mean, if now if there were British loyalists invading New York or Philadelphia or Boston and creating havoc, it probably would have had a, a much bigger shockwave. But this is a small little town on, on the Jersey Shore, and it was one of however many salt mills that are already in existence. Right. And I'm sure Washington knew damn well that there was still privateering going on. Mm-hmm. So in his wisdom, he's probably like, well, they pr- kind of brought it on themselves. You shouldn't have done that. And at the end of the day, Joshua Huddy's not one of his men. He's a militiaman. He's... Not even, not, not even in the army. He's not, but but I, I, kind of, I kind of, the opposite of that is too, I kind of, it just speaks to Washington's character that he was willing to, not that I want to see anybody executed, but he was right. willing to do the right thing yes. militarily as, the, as, as those people see it right. at that time. Like at, as per their, as per their um, tradition, I don't know how you would say yeah. that, this is what you do. Right. The fact that, He took it into consideration to the point that he was going to do it. Now, another question I have is, with the militia and Joshua Huddy being a captain in the militia, the ties to the Continental Army, like, does Washington really care too much? Really, if if anything, in in Washington's mind, I would assume it's like, okay, well, one of my citizens was killed. Yes. But my citizen was in his own militia killing other British officers who— were I guess now technically American citizens, so it's like what do you? How do you look at that situation? I mean, and he's not super duper. He's not beholden to Huddy. And also, I think we talked about it before, and I think it's important to bring it up. Um, we've come up with pretty good analogies for things. Yeah. Um, we said that the militias, whether it was the Continental Army, George yes. Washington's army, the, the, the trained soldiers, or the militias, the colonial militia of let's say New Jersey or even the British Army with the Loyalist militias. Yes. Regardless of sides, the, the regular soldiers in the army looked at the militia as like, which is said, the JV team. Yeah. Right? It, it's like... They're not... Okay. They're there, but they, 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 need, to, they need to do what they're told. Like, right. it, it was almost like a, like a, like a stratific- stratification, I guess, social stratification, or however yeah. you want to look at that. And that, those ha- that like, structure that they had where they looked at colonials as kind of like maybe second-rate, especially second-rate soldiers, uh, as you had mentioned, because m- before the podcast you had mentioned that Minutemen, on both loyalists and patriots, incredibly unreliable, had no obligations to uphold. They were just volunteers, and they showed up when they wanted to. It wasn't as... Uh, I guess, fairy talistic as mm-hmm. as I would assume growing up. They didn't just show up in, in, in the nick of time to take out some British officers. It was... They Did that happen? Be, yes, of course. Sure, of course. But, it's, but especially it, in the bigger cities like in Boston and Philadelphia. But it's not likely, like that was the norm. No. You know, oh my gosh, we're yes. losing. Let's call in the Minutemen. Exactly. It wasn't that and, either. And, and that, as I was going to mention, the, the perspective that normal, regular soldiers would have in the Continental Army and in the British Army looking at 
the militias, it's, that, that's gone back to the French and Indian War, or the, the Seven Years' War, where you had colonials being, uh, you know, volunteering to fight in the French and Indian War, of course, on the American continent. The, the mainland British fellas did not look at their colonial counterparts as equal to them. They didn't, they didn't think that they were as good of soldiers. They thought that, you know, to them they were foreigners. They didn't really care. So there was that lack of respect that had always remained persistent. Look at George Washington in the French and Indian War. I mean, I'm sure they were like, wasn't that guy who really screwed up in the beginning <laughs> of the French and Indian War? He's leading their army? Yeah. And then you have that, and then you have King George at the end of the war who's like, I, I, no, it was at the end of the war. I think it was, yeah, it was at the end of the war when Washington um, gave up his commission. He started to retire his commission mm -hmm. as general. And George, King George III hears that and says, if he does that, He'll be the greatest man who ever lived, or right. something like that. And maybe it, it, it could. It, maybe it was when Washington didn't run for a third term. I might be confusing that, but my, my point is, you've got these soldiers who aren't taken seriously, who then go on to really prove themselves to be yes. great leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I I want to go back to the Minutemen real quick uh, because we, we brought it up. I. I don't want to make it sound like I'm making disparaging remarks about the Minutemen because I, I, what I respect about them is that it's kind of like teaching, what, what I'm teaching, right? You were, you were a great student in school. Um, your hand was always up all the time. But to me, the Minutemen are like the kid who maybe doesn't always get it, might not be the brightest, but mm -hmm. always tries and always has her hand up and, and is like willing to like, hey, I'll do it. I'll volunteer. I, I, yeah. that, to me, that's the Minutemen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I like that better than the straight-A student who always right. has the right answer. And so that's kind of like how I'm like... Well, they definitely add to the, the cause as a whole. And the fact that they yeah. were willing to do it. I just didn't want to make it sound like, like I no, and, and I and I, and I and I don't... I didn't mean to no, make I, it that way. No, I did. Uh, so I, mean, <laughs> I, I did. I take but, blame for that. But they are... But regardless, I mean, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, any team, if you have a, a junior varsity, it's because they just aren't good enough. Right. And But if you look at the Continental Soldiers at the time... You know, before Baron von Schuben, where they, they weren't really good they, they weren't good at all. <laughs> you know, and granted, they were incredibly brave, and they had they were the most courageous of them all. But there is a reality, and there is a, a, a discrepancy there that it's it's remarkable that the American Revolution was a success for the Americans. And of course, if it wasn't for the French, if it wasn't for guerrilla tactics from Farmers and tavern owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't be talking about this today. Exactly. Um, and, and I think I think people lose that they, they they lose that understanding that the American Revolution really was fought by people that don't always even make it into history books. Look at women. Look at people of different races. Absolutely. I mean, you, you look at not only African American people who served as soldiers, but also look at the Creole people, the people of mixed blood down in down in like the Louisiana area. I wasn't, no, it wasn't part of the United States yet, but people living in that area under Spanish control even, that they, they were they were working for the war effort. Right. So, so it's, it's American Indians who, in Tom's River, if we, if we, on that side of the room, we'll do it at a different time, Native Americans who fought on both sides. Right. Indian Tom, who people, some people say that Tom's River was named after, apparently he was a spy for the British. I learned that today. That's that, and in his and for good reason for him <laughs> yeah. absolutely and and that's and that's really what's the interesting component is about you, you talk about Tom River and its impact on the American Revolution that just opens up a whole nother avenue to unknown parts of history as, as you had just mentioned it's such a multifaceted beast that you will need 1500 whatever podcasts to talk about each individual little yeah. thing, because there's so many details. And it's like, we've been talking for almost an hour, and there's still other implications we can talk about that stems from this, and, and yep. other parts of the country as well. I, I wonder, and I'm sure I could, being in the Ocean County Historical um, Society now, in the building, and even you know, um, joining it myself officially as of tomorrow, I am now wondering, what do we know what happened to those families? Mm -hmm. who were displaced. Right. And I couldn't really find any I do know, I know that a lot of the names survived. 
Yes. So, uh, so a lot of the names that that are still names in Tom's River in the area. Mm-hmm. So I'm imagining they went somewhere local and maybe then came back. So right. I, mean, I, I do want to. They went to Tom's River North. They went to Tom's River. They went to the. They went to the new part of town. Um, but so we'll wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. So I hope everybody enjoyed this episode on the Battle of the Tom's River Blockhouse. As always with Josh, um, we don't just look at Battle of Tom's River it was March 24th, 1782, because that's freaking boring. All right. So you, you can look that up on your own. Just go to Wikipedia and highlight it and click speak and it'll talk to you. We're, we're not we're not doing that. But I wanted to talk briefly about something that uh, you mentioned about history being so multifaceted and everything. When I first started this podcast, it, I'm not going to say it came to me. It wasn't like an epiphany, like like the angels mm-hmm. came and started singing to me or anything like that. I've always liked New Jersey history. I've, I've cited a couple of previous episodes that I taught a little bit of it. For I mean, I teach it, but I taught a little bit of it as, as an actual subject. And um, I couldn't believe there wasn't a podcast on it. Like it really, it yeah. really surprised. I don't know if that's me fangirling about New Jersey history. Well, aside from I, the it Battle like, of Monmouth, I guess and people just the, don't the crossing of the Delaware. Like, yeah, what, 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 what else do happened, historians right? really talk about? Yeah, <laughs> but but that's just there's just so much. I mean, I'm getting more into this, and I'm saying I could do an episode on that. I could do an episode on that. Could you could do an episode on on the Civil War yeah. and how Ocean County was the only county that supported Abraham Lincoln. Pretty much. I, I, I mean, I think people that's pretty in cool. my life are getting tired of me saying, well, "I could do a podcast episode." Like, like I'm, I'm, be, I'm like actually. Well, just write it down. There's, and that's that's the next one on the list. I, I, I do, I, and but I'm really starting to become like that annoying, like, like no. annoying. Um, so let's <laughs> let's all do a vote right now. Who thinks Josh should take over running the podcast? Absolutely that, not. I, 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 I don't know. Josh is much better than no, I am. So we give, a, we're giving you all. credit for that, Josh. Nope. Um, let's email New Jersey NJ History Podcast at Gmail dot com. Do you want to give yours? Sure. You can email me at joshuachanley1 at gmail if you have any questions or curiosities about history. I, w- I will give you my, my best answer. There you go. So make, make sure you have that number one. Either email me or him or both. Um, dear Josh, how do you get your hair to lay flat on your head? I, we were talking about that before because I said check your hair, and then I said do you want me to check mine, and I said I just parted it in the middle today. <laughs> So um, email him, email me. I have a feeling that we'll be back here. I think so. Or somewhere like that. Um, Also email us with any suggestions. So I hope you enjoy the Battle of Tom's River. And uh, look for, I didn't do a New Jersey Shore episode this week. I'll be doing that um, this coming week on Island Heights. So that kind of ties in because of that. All right. So we're signing off for now, right? Yes, thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure. We're celebrating the triumphant return of Josh.